everyone on Zoom. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I would like to uh, start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where the University of Southern Kingdom stands and pay my respect to uh, their elders, past, present, and emerging. And I would like to continue uh, with another type of uh, acknowledgement because a large part of the study that I'm going to present today uh, um, has been recently published in this paper. And I would like to acknowledge all the co-authors there, and especially uh, Nilou Farragifi, uh, Kaylin Branslow, John Dierley, Susumu Takamatsu, and Yu Pei Ten for their huge contributions uh, to this work. Uh, so basically, we are done for today. If you are interested in uh, this topic, that's the paper to be checked. Uh, but I can expand uh, uh, the topic a little bit. Um, obviously, boundary mildews are well known for everyone uh, within the field of uh, plant pathology. So I would only like to uh, uh, highlight four dot points about boundary mildews. First of all, they are very easy to spot uh, due to the symptoms that they cause. However, they are difficult to handle. The fungi that cause boundary mildew infections are difficult to handle because they are strictly associated with their host plants. This is because of their obvious biotropic nature. So in the laboratory, uh, you need sp special techniques to maintain and study powder mildews. Uh, you need uh, the fresh host plant tissues to be able to culture, subculture, uh, different powder mildew isolates and uh, do different tricks with those. Uh, the uh, third dot point is that some of the mildews are difficult to handle and they're difficult to ID, difficult, uh, different, uh, difficult to identify. And I will come back to this point in a minute. And some species, as you know very well, are economically uh, very important and cause uh, a lot of uh, losses and uh, require a, a lot of uh, fungicides uh, every year to control uh, all the mildews in a number of uh, uh, broad acre and horticultural and other crops. Now, just a few ideas about how are powder mildew species and genera uh, identified, and this is important for the rest of the talk. Uh, first of all, it's light microscopy, uh, simple light microscopy uh, to check uh, the, the asexual morphs of powder mildew, which are the structures that produce, that produce the asexual uh, spores or polydia. Um, and I won't go into detail. Some of the new species uh, regularly produce their sexual morphs, which have a, a beautiful geometry. And uh, already in the 19th century, in that book, Art, Forms, and Nature, uh, it is available online, by the way, it's open access, uh, you will find drawings of uh, uh, a number of scientists in the 19th century, and especially Ernst Haeckel, uh, who draw these beautiful uh, uh, structures uh, of powder mildews that as uh, visible under the uh, light microscope. Now, the uh, third uh, clue to identify how the mildews is their host plants, and some host plants, and especially some crops, are infected with only a single powder mildew species, like uh, wheat or barley uh, or grapes or apple. So, if you see powder mildew symptoms on these crops, you know that you have uh, just one powder mildew species there. However, other Plants are infected with a number of species. Some of them are very different, some of them are closely related. So uh, the host range uh, of different other species is an uh, interesting and complicated issue. And of course, we have the DNA sequences, the so-called DNA barcodes there. Uh, and I will talk about these a little bit more in detail. So we have these four uh, clues, four tools to identify other species. What do you trust more? Obviously, in the 21st century, most final identifications are based on uh, DNA sequences only, um, which is a quite reliable way of identifying uh, other mildews. However, with these uh, DNA sequences, we only have sequences from a few randomly collected specimens. So we should not, never forget this. In terms of host range, if we do experiments, we only use a number of host plant genotypes. So we may not get the full answer about uh, the powder mildew species identification. And in terms of morphology, those are not always um, 
as detailed as they should be and not always as informative as they could be. So uh, just bear in mind uh, these things uh, about how the media notifications. Now, DNA barcodes, that's the way to do it, uh, usually in, in, in fungal identifications these days. And uh, what I can tell is that there are huge databases of uh, different uh, DNA barcode sequences from other immune species, mostly the so-called nuclear ribosomal DNA uh, sequences, ITS sequences, 28S and 18S sequences. We will come back to this uh, in a minute. Um, and we don't really have other uh, DNA regions that can be used for uh, powder mildew identification yet. In other fungal groups, we have uh, many more uh, DNA regions for, for identification. Now, there are huge phylogenetic analysis of these sequences in different groups of powder mildews, um, and uh, these all support nicely the identification of powder mildew species based on morphology and host range. So we have a reliable uh, DNA barcode system there that nicely supports what we can actually uh, identify based on light microscopy and host range. And the other uh, figure there, the other uh, little cladogram there on the, on the screen is based on whole genome analysis. Um, I think the only one to my knowledge published last year and the whole genome analysis nicely supported uh, all the groupings based on uh, ribosomal DNA sequences. And the ribosomal DNA sequence uh, analysis nicely supported morphology and host range. So it looks like we have a very good system to identify uh, powder near new species based on DNA barcodes. And now let's come back to Australia. So how can we use in Australia uh, clearly or there uh, a knowledge gap. And to show this, I would like to show you the map, the database map of the most recent worldwide monograph, which is here on the screen, uh, written by Uwe Brown and Roger Cook in uh, 2012. So the map shows where did all the specimens studied to produce this monograph. And as you can see, there are no red dots uh, uh, in Australia. I hate to say that there are red dots even in New Zealand, but nothing in Australia. So that's why it's, uh, it's a knowledge gap, or it used to be a knowledge gap. Uh, what kind of other new species are here in Australia? And other obvious biotrophy uh, uh, plant pathogens uh, are much better known, and we have databases of what is already here in the country. And this, I have just two examples there. One is the RAS fungi and the other one is SMAT uh, fungi. Uh, nice databases, we know what is here in the country. Uh, however, in, in uh, powder news, something like that was really missing. Now, there were uh, studies to identify uh, powder new species in Australia. Uh, and the first studies focused on what species are on native Australian plants versus what species are on crops. Why is this so important? There are two reasons for that. First of all, we are talking about uh, fungi that are strictly plant associated. So obviously it's very important to know what is on the native Australian vegetation and what is on the intended crops. But there is another reason, and this is uh, called botanical patriotism. What's this? Botanical patriotism. It's not just botanical, it's biological patriotism in, in Australia. So all biologists and also plant pathologists and everyone dealing with the living world has been very much focused on uh, studying plants, animals, microbes, any kind of living creatures on native uh, Australian plants, other animals in Australia in general, versus what was introduced. So this is a kind of botanical patriot, patriotism, and there is that paper from 2019, which described this uh, very nicely as an irrational botanical nationalism. I better call it patriotism. So uh, I have found the other this paper uh, in uh, in the journal Austral Ecology, and obviously the Dingo is a very good example for a recently introduced 
uh, animal species to Australia, is it mating or it's not? That's the question. And we will come back to this point. Is this really important to decide whether a, a species that has already been here for some time is it mating or not? So, coming back to the reviews and to these first studies um, done in the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, these were focused on other new infections of native Australian plants. And the presumption was that whatever infects a native Australian plant, in terms of powder mildew, that should be a native powder mildew species. And this, uh, these studies uh, did recognize a number of species on native Australian plants, and these were described as native Australian powder mildew species. Uh, I just have two uh, examples there on the screen. However, the knowledge gap remained there. So the, I started a project to address this knowledge gap in 2017. And uh, my initial ideas were to produce a comprehensive list of what is reliably, what has been reliably identified in Australia. And then to identify as many new powdery medium species on both native and introduced plants as possible. How to do this? You can't do this alone. Uh, so, uh, the idea was to organize a workshop, a national workshop, in collaboration with uh, plant pathology experts across Australia. Uh, they are all members of the National Plant Biosecurity Diagnostic Network. And uh, this workshop, this is a five-day long workshop uh, here at the University of Southern Queensland, uh, was supported by the Department of Agriculture, now Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment. So before uh, the participants uh, uh, came to uh, USQ, long before, actually half a year before, um, I requested them to collect as many powdered mildew spe uh, specimens as possible uh, in their environments from all kinds of uh, host plants. Uh, and some of them uh, had uh, very good uh, molecular laboratories, so they, they did the sequencing of the so-called IPS sequences. Some others sent us specimens, and we did the sequencing here, of as many specimens, fresh specimens, as possible. We have also studied uh, as many herbarium specimens as possible from different plant pathology herbaria across Australia. And uh, we did the sequencing of the ITS uh, region, although we know the uh, limits of, uh, of uh, all, the, uh, all the identifications of all the is based on uh, this region, uh, this little com commentary that with, uh, with all these problems. Now, uh, another step uh, before the workshop was to check all the DNA barcodes of all the powdery mildew species collected in Australia that are publicly available in uh, NCBI GPAC. And surprisingly, there were not too many there. Uh, we could only find 32 species of powdery mildews representing 80 genera that were reliably identified by DNA sequences, by IPS sequences, openly accessible in GPAC. And we did not use another database, which is called the Australian Plant Pest Database, uh, because that one is not based on molecular identifications, and there are lots of errors there. Everyone uh, uh, confirmed this. So we didn't use the Australian Plant Pest Database, which, is, which are just records of uh, uh, number of, number of uh, uh, data. We only used DNA barcodes. That was our uh, approach. During the workshop, it was just like a normal workshop. Uh, we did a lot of microscopy of the specimens collected by the participants across the country. Also, we did microscopy of a number of old herbarium specimens borrowed from uh, Australian plant pathology herbaria, and uh, we also uh, uh, checked the sequences, and Nehru Park conducted a wonderful uh, section there uh, for sequence analysis. This was the workshop, and during the workshop already, uh, we discovered uh, uh, a new powder needle species on a legume crop that has been widely grown here around uh, uh, southern Queensland, the powder mildew is very common on this crop, and it uh, used to be considered as being caused by a single species. Uh, it's there on the screen. However, during the workshop, 
during that microscopy section, actually, we did these photos, and it turned quickly out that, oops, we have another species there which has never been uh, taken in consideration. Another, uh, a number of other discoveries uh, were done during the workshop. For example, a huge analysis uh, of the, the RTS sequences of just one powder mildew species revealed that clade there, which is really uh, looks like a new lineage, and um, it looks like uh, it may contain powder mildew species that are new to Australia. However, if you check what is there, uh, oh yeah, you can't tell based on uh, what is on the screen. Some specimens came from overseas. So we are deposited in GBank from overseas. So we have here a group of powder mildews, unidentified powder mildews, same IPS sequences, some of them in Asia, some of them in Europe, some of them in South America, and some of them from Australia. But they were new, so no one overseas, no, no one recognized these as new species. Then we focused on native, Australian native plants. Uh, Jagera on the screen is a native uh, Australian rainforest tree species. And uh, we found powder yield on this species. This is a new record, no one has ever uh, found this. This is not important. What is important is that the mildew was caused by a species that is well known overseas. So we had a native plant there, infected with powder mildew. However, the species was some a species that was introduced to Australia for sure, found also on other introduced plant species, and also this thing. And the same thing with this group of mildews. I won't go into detail. And uh, the new species on Monday. And then something that looked more exciting. Uh, in a rainforest, uh, we found a very strange powder mildew with some, as you can see there, brownish melanized spores, brownish conidiophores, and so unique morphology. Some uh, conidiophores were short, so this is the asexual morph. Some others were long. No one has ever seen anything like that. If you check that huge monograph that I mentioned from 2012, it's not there. And the host plant was an Australian native for a califa memorum in a rainforest. Wow. So we have a native plant. We have a powdery mildew there that is unique morphology. Maybe we found something that is, uh, maybe we found the powdery mildew species that is native to Australia. And if you don't trust me, and if you don't trust the morphology that is there, uh, we have also sequenced uh, the IPS, the 28S, and the 18S uh, sequences. And based on a combined analysis, this was uh, clearly a new lineage. So yes, it's new lineage, which means a new genus. However, when we checked the old literature, we found the description of this unique morphology of the mildew from India, from the 1950s. So in the 1950s, a gentleman in India already recognized this powder mildew on another Akarifa species. He tried it, and then it was forgotten. It was not even included in the monograph. Uh, it was simply not considered as a new genus. So, did we find a, a, a powder mildew native to Australia in this one? It's unique morphology, native host, but the same mildew then was found on a very common ornamental shrub, common in Brisbane, everywhere you go. It's called uh, Acarifa mirkesiana. It has these weird leaves. It has powder mildew. Morphology is the same. IPS sequences 18S, 20S, the same. And then, if you look through Gene Bank, you will find the same mildew from uh, Indonesia and even from Argentina. So, again, we had a mildew on an ornamental, which may have been introduced with the ornamental, which may have jumped uh, on this native Akalifa species in the rainforest. So, native to Australia, no. What are the results of the workshop? Altogether, we were able to list only 42 species uh, and 10 genera of mildew in Australia. And that's not much. I will come back to this point in a minute. We did a little bit of taxonomy. We did rediscover uh, basically a genus which has been described a long time ago, uh, and then it was forgotten. And yes, we did uh, describe a, a few new species. However, as I said, all powder mildew species identified during the workshop and previously 
and everything that is available in gene bank is exotic. It was introduced from overseas. So are there no native organ DNA to species in Australia? The botanical patriotism cannot be supported. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what we found on native plants. First of all, they were rare. We only found a very few cases of mildew on native plants. And as I said, all species were exotic. Then here is an iconic paper from 1983 long before the molecular era, long before uh, the very strong uh, uh, system of identifying target DNAs, 1983. However, this is really a, an iconic paper there, uh, titled Specific Mycogeography, as you can see. And the idea is pretty much the same there. Although that time, uh, uh, Walker, who put together this uh, comprehensive study, didn't have, uh, and he did uh, highlight in his paper, that he cannot identify a number of asexual morphs and other things. He did highlight there that only a few native uh, uh, Australian plants were infected with new new. Uh, he didn't come to the conclusion that these were all exotic, but he suspected already there. The same idea. And I won't uh, expand this very much, but we all know the Australian history from 1788, from the first flea. And since then, and basically 1788 is considered as a watershed in the evolution of the Australian vegetation. Because a huge number of, uh, of plant and of course animal and microbial species were introduced. And let me just refer to these two books. Uh, I like the title of uh, the green one, A Continent Transformed. And this is what actually happened here from 1788. Uh, as Kim can confirm, all the crops, all the crops grown in Australia are introduced except macadamia, right? So macadamia is the only one which is a native Australian and it's grown commercially. So uh, most probably a huge number of crop pathogens were actually introduced to Australia with these crops. But it's not so easy. Uh, the whole question is not so easy. I will come back to this in a minute. There is one uh, paper there from the Australian Academy of Sciences. Uh, that report states that there are more introduced plant species in Australia at the moment than native species. So the introduced plant species in Australia actually outnumber the native plant species. So it's, it's a, 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 indeed the whole continent was transformed. And it's easy to understand that, let's say, grape or wheat or barley powder mildew was introduced with the crops. However, we are here focusing on the natives. So what is happening with the natives? Before that, uh, let me just cite a number of other studies here. So yes, Australia is an island continent, we know that. However, there were studies, very good studies, that showed that actually the northern coast is actually exposed to a, a number of uh, uh, microbes that can actually reach Australia by wind and by a number of other uh, ways. So it is possible that, let's say, a number of spores can come across uh, Torres Islands and all these other re regions. However, other immunities are obligate microbes. Uh, their spores or colleagues are short lived. So even if they reach uh, the Australian continent, if the host plants, their host plants have, were not present here, they would have uh, very easily uh, perished and not survived. So most likely all the species, all those 42 and only 42, they are actually introduced together with the plants, which means the infected plant material. And just let, let, let us uh, focus on the number of other new species in the world based on the monograph there. Uh, let's start with the genus Elisaifi. Uh, as you, you can see in Asia, we have around 340 species. In Europe, we have 100, North America 100, uh, South America, which hasn't been surveyed that much, only 52 were recognized. And in Australia, we have 17 based on our study. Uh, and also based on uh, this paper. Let's look for another genus, and this is my last uh, uh, example, Norovinomyces. You see, uh, 
a lower number of species worldwide, 37 in Asia, 33 in Europe, and so on and so on, and only 10 in Australia. And I won't go into detail, but uh, in the paper we have a detailed analysis. And again, I will refer to this paper about the biogeography of this genus. Now, let's come back to the question that I've already raised. Does it really matter whether a species that is already here, or has already been here for some time, might have been born? Uh, is it native or not? Does it really matter? And we as climatologists, we continuously diligently produce new disease reports, right? Uh, in, in plant disease, in Australian uh, plant disease notes and a number of uh, number of journals. Whatever is new, it, I think it is very important that it is identified and reported there. However, there is this paper uh, from, I think, last year, uh, and there is a prediction about, specifically about how the diseases which are highly invasive uh, crop pathogens, that by 2050, probably most or all of other new species will reach all available hosts anywhere in the world. Uh, that is their prediction. I hope it won't happen. I hope this won't happen. And why it won't happen? I borrowed this slide from uh, Lynn O'Connor's fantastic talk um, two years ago about the Australian biosecurity system and plant and also biosecurity uh, in general, so animal biosecurity system. There are a number of pests listed there, uh, you know, Silella, Varroa, uh, foot and mouth disease, and so on and so on. As you can see, all these species are kept outside Australia. They don't have it. All these big pests haven't reached Australia yet, and for, hopefully they will never reach Australia. Why? Because the biosecurity system does work. All these other, all these pests of agricultural importance, not just plants, also animals, uh, they are all over the world except here. Even New Zealand got uh, one of these uh, uh, very dangerous uh, exotic pests. So, to summarize, and this is really the end, I can promise, uh, the first comprehensive data set of thousand million species that we produced in this study show, clearly showed that the number of species here in the city is low. That, that in itself already shows that uh, these should be, should have been introductions, right? Uh, on natives, there are only very uh, rare uh, uh, cases of infections, and all the species that we identified are exotic. Uh, obviously, more DNA markers are needed. However, what we have now, it's quite reliable and it works very well. And all the species that we identified are uh, widespread uh, globally, except these two. Let me come back to these two that were identified in the early age of uh, molecular identification of other immune. So there is, there are still a number of question marks there. And as a, a future project, uh, we have the capacity, we don't have the funds, but we have the capacity to produce an open access uh, comprehensive database of all the species that have been identified here. And uh, something similar to what we already have for rusts and what we have for smarts. So uh, Australia should not stay like a blank spot there on the map in terms of how they need it. So acknowledgements, once again, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the contributions of uh, my colleagues uh, mentioned as the uh, introduction and the workshop was uh, Funded by the Australian Department of Agriculture or the BMI. Thank you for your attention. So I am the one who asked uh, you to ask questions or comments, also on Zoom. Uh,